Matthew chapter 5 tonight. We'll once again read verses 1 through 12, and tonight we're focusing on verse number 8. Uh, we began this series at the beginning of the year, and I was thinking, that, and we'll see, I was thinking the book of Matthew might take us a year and a half, but it's looking like it could be longer, and uh, that's okay. I would rather for us to take a long time going through verse by verse and feasting on what God has for us in His Word than taking nibbles. Now, I saw on the, uh, the sign-up sheet several things in food, and, and you know how food is. You know what sticks in your mind? Dessert. And I tell you what, I saw cheesecake. I like cheesecake. I like cheesecake a lot. I saw uh, meringue pie. Um, there was other, there was another dessert on there. And it just slipped my mind because I got excited about cheesecake. And, uh, but I'm going to tell you, if all you have is sweets or dessert, you're going to leave with a sugar rush, and you're probably going to very soon be hungry again. And, uh, and the key is, if all you go there and eat is a piece of chicken, that's not really a full meal. And I would rather have a full meal any time than to nibble on something. And so I'm thankful that we can take time and grow. And that's, that's our, our, our focus here is that as we're walking in the way, we may grow. The Bible says um, that we may grow thereby. And that's, that's what we need to do is feast on the Word. The Bible talks about the milk of the Word and the meat of the Word. And uh, I want us to get into the meat of the Word tonight. I'll tell you, the Beatitudes is where when it comes to the Christian life, the rubber meets the road. And uh, we'll look at some of that uh, this evening. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse number 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Tonight we're going to focus on verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart. For they shall see God. And let's pray. Dear Lord, I pray that you'll use me now as a vessel to speak through. I pray that you'll remove uh, distractions from us tonight. And that we'll be able to focus on your word. That Lord, you will move in our hearts. That you'll challenge us in this area of being pure in heart. And that we may see you tonight, Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I remember seeing a cartoon that showed a pastor and his wife in conversation. And don't you like those, those cartoons that show uh, conversations? And oftentimes they're funny, but they were having a conversation. And the wife said to the pastor, said, uh, today, why don't we try something different? He says, okay, I'm up for something different. She said, why don't you be charming at home and grouchy in church instead of the other way around? <laughs> and uh, you've probably heard this before. Uh, one w a wife said one time, she says, oh, by the way, for me, I know that couldn't be about me because I'm grouchy in both places. So <laughs> it couldn't be about me. But there was a woman said, uh, sometimes I just wake up grouchy and other times I let him sleep in. And the reality, and you'll catch that one in a minute, she just called her husband grouchy and uh, they have been married 36 years. That being said, uh, uh, and she said 31 of them were happy. No, but, but uh, the reality is this. Oftentimes, people like to put on one thing in public. And in private, it's a total different thing. And I'll be honest with you, that's why I think it's very important that we apply into our lives very careful discernment on what we say when we talk to others because we don't really know what they're going through, dealing with other people that we go, well, that person's a good person. We're going to get to talk about a little bit about having a good heart and so forth tonight. But we need to make sure that we're careful. People oftentimes have learned how to behave in such a way. A pastor friend of mine, he said when he was a kid, his dad was also a pastor, and when he was a kid, he said he was a professional at looking like he was listening. He said he knew how to sit in church 
And it looked like he was honed in. He was, I'm not going to tell you all the secrets, but he said, man, he said part of it was being leaned forward and looking toward the pulpit. And every now and then giving a little nod and so forth. He said, but I always feared that his dad as pastor would say, hey, son, you know the answer to that question. What is it? He says, because then suddenly he was going to have, you know, some sort of uh, memory lapse. Where am I? You know, and, and so forth. But he said he was a professional at looking like he was listening. And some people have become a professional of putting on a front. And can I say, as believers, it's important that we are just real people. You've probably got them, if you are on Facebook, you've got them as friends. The people who, if you look at their Facebook, their life is perfect. I've seen some people on Facebook, if I ever needed a marketing manager, I would pick them. Because they know how to take something and turn it into something greater than it's like, wow. You know how I mentioned this morning when you're selling a car and you would put it back in the day in the wheels and deals? You could take a picture of one side and it look pretty and you get to the other side and realize it's not so hot. And boy, some people have become masters at trying to portray on the outside that everything is perfect. They have subscribed to this idea of fake it till you make it. And can I say... That is a very poor attitude to have. Can I say, you know, I take, for instance, happiness and joy. Well, if you're having a bad day, just smile and fake it till you make it. Can I say, if you're having a bad day, count the blessings that the Lord has given into your life. And guess what? You won't have to fake it. Amen. And at the same time, there are certain things that come into your life that as we look back at blessed are they that mourn, that you need to take some time and mourn, and you don't need to fake it. You need to properly grieve over that loss, or else you're going to allow that loss to hold you back the rest of your life if you don't choose to properly grieve over whatever that loss is. And so as we look at this idea, some people have subscribed to this idea, I will just put on a front. And can I say, as Christians, putting on a front does more of a harm to the reputation of Jesus Christ than anything else. One of the biggest hindrances that people use, and oftentimes it's as an excuse, I understand that, but sometimes they have real legitimate reasons, is I don't go to church because there's so many hypocrites there. I'm going to say this, a lot of times we will we'll joke back and go, well, do you go to Walmart? Because there's a bunch there too. And can I say this, all, right off the bat, this is not a perfect church. You know why? Because none of us are Jesus. I've got problems, you've got problems, and I've said before, I'm the first to say I've got problems, but if you'd be nice and not point all of them out, I would appreciate it. But we do. And the reality is sometimes we may mess up. And aren't you glad that God's still faithful and just to forgive us? That's not an excuse to mess up, but we're going to mess up. But there's no need to put on this front as if we're perfect people because we're not. And when we fake it, guess what? Now they have ammunition that, guess what? You are a hypocrite. And so can I say this? Rather than giving them an excuse to say they don't come to church because there's so many hypocrites, let's just not be hypocrites and be real. God has called us to serve in sincerity and in truth. And a lot of times we want to take the truth and, and sort of paint a picture. Can I say this? You don't have to pose the truth. The truth is just fact. And God wants us to serve him in sincerity and in truth. And so as we, we look at this passage tonight, we're looking at blessed are the pure in heart, but it's important that we kind of look back a little bit to last Sunday night when we looked at blessed are the merciful. Now, we looked last Sunday night, and mercy involves releasing people from the debt. It's really forgiving a debt. It's not giving to someone something that they deserve, and not in the, not in the sense of, well, you deserve a reward, and I'm going to be merciful to you not get it. No, it's you deserve punishment. And we looked at the man who owed, in our day, what would be millions of dollars, and his, his master said, rather than you having to go to jail, and your wife having to go to jail, and your kids having to go to jail, and everything that you have being sold to pay your debt, and probably really in that case, probably only part of the debt, he fell, he found compassion, he found mercy, and the master said, you're forgiven of all. That's mercy. We found what he did with his mercy. He went and found somebody that owed him a couple bucks, and he took it out on him. 
And he didn't realize the mercy that he had received is supposed to be shown to others. And you and I have been with mercy. God has extended his mercy. And God has provided a way that we don't have to go to hell. And can I say, that's like being forgiven. In fact, that's greater than being forgiven of millions of dollars. And so we ought to be merciful to other people. Now, in this passage... From that verse, in verse 7, God is now making a transition from us looking to our neighbor and, and extending mercy. And now, we must focus on ourselves. Can I say, it's a lot easier to focus on you than it is to me. Focus on me. In fact, that's one of the reasons that we struggle in reading the Bible, I believe, is because it points out our sin. Boy, it's a lot easier for us whenever we hear a preacher preach on sin. This is including myself, by the way. When I hear myself preaching on sin, it's a lot easier for me to go, yeah, that's good over there, isn't it? It's good for that person. It's good for that person on the back row on this side, since there's nobody there right now. And uh, it's one of those, but it's a little bit harder when I go, ooh, that's me. This morning when I gave that list of people, I'll be honest with you, I looked around and there were people going, oh, that's so-and-so. I saw, I saw parents talking to each other, and, and uh, they're like, oh, you just described this kid, you know, that kind of thing. And Because that's natural for us to do, but boy, whenever we come across that personality that we are, it's kind of like, so what's wrong with that? <laughs> you know, that's kind of how our attitude is, because we don't like to focus on sin. The Bible tells us here, blessed are the pure in heart. And so as we look at the term pure, it's important that we understand what it means. Oftentimes, we only apply this word to one part of life, but it's so much more. And the term pure means cleansing of the mind or the emotions. So first, it means to make pure by cleansing from dirt and filth and disgustingness. We had that little flood, a little flood, big flood, we're going to consider it downstairs and Yesterday, they brought that vacuum cleaner in, and we began to clean and clean and clean. And it was amazing what we already thought was clean, how much dirt and grime was in there. In fact, I vacuumed this front portion here of carpet that's fairly new, and it had already been vacuumed, and I used the, the other vacuum that was brought in, and I was amazed at how much dirt came out of it. It was just like, whoa. And can I say, oftentimes when we look at ourselves in the mirror, when we think over our life, we look and go, we're good. I'm good. I'm not as bad as my neighbor. I'm not as bad as so-and-so. We compare ourselves among ourselves and we go, wow, I'm good. I don't need to clean anything up. I'm looking pretty good right now. And then we open up the Word of God and we realize there's a lot more grime. And there's a lot more dirt there. And so to be pure means to make pure by cleansing from dirt, filth, or contamination. So it's free of that. But secondly, it means unmixed as having no double allegiance. For instance, are you a pure patriot or, or do you kind of flip-flop sides? You ever been playing on a team and somebody on your team suddenly like sells out and goes to the other team? At youth camp, we have something called strength and beauty competition. And I don't get it because they say the guys are the strength and the women are the beauty. Well, what if you got both? That was meant to be a joke. But anyway, uh, what if you got both? Sometimes at school, I don't know if you've ever done this before, somebody will open up the door and they'll say age before beauty. And I, almost every time I'll stop and look at the kid, sarcastically, of course. I don't do this to new kids because they haven't learned me yet. But sarcastically, he'll go, so, so do I go or not? Because I got both, you know? And, and that's definitely sarcasm and so forth. But we have this strength and beauty competition. And up to a couple years ago, we would have a song competition. Each cabin would write a song. It was for a lot of points in the strength and beauty competition. And I say, what's at stake at the strength and beauty competition? What is at stake is there's a trophy that will say, for instance, this year, 2015, and either the boys will be the winner and they'll go on the trophy or the girls. And really, for most people, that's not that big of a deal because not too many people go look at the trophy. It's more bragging rights. But even more than that, it's also a pie in the face at stake. Because if the girls win, the boys, they have to, they, they come up one by one, they call them up, and they get a shaving cream pie to their face. But when the boys win, amen, when the boys win, then they get to pie the girls. And it's awesome, and it's a lot of fun. And for a lot of points at that time, each cabin would write a song, and they would go against each other with their song, and whoever had the best song would win. Well, it was one year, and the, the, I mean, it was close one year. 
And here we are, you know, the boys, yeah, we're going to win, you know, our song's better. And uh, the girls' cabin gets up there, and they sing some little song, and I forget what it was, and they sing the song. And at the end of a song, one of the girls in that cabin's boyfriend gets up out of his seat, comes forward, and takes a pie for their song. You're talking about selling out your side. He helped them win, and he's a boy helping the girls. He almost didn't get a ride back. It was terrible because he really, what he did is he didn't have a pure allegiance to, sadly, his own gender. And it's frustrating if you've ever had that. If you've ever had somebody that's on your team just kind of sell you out and go, I think I'm going to join this team now. It's like, what are you doing? And as we look at purity, purity, if we were to put these two together, a person with a passion for purity is one who has been cleansed in character so that he or she looks like in public what they are in private. Now, I'm going to tell you, when it comes to purity, it is important that we realize that it's not about what everybody else sees. It's about what is reality. I want to tell you, if you're not careful, you will look at things and it says it looks beautiful, not realizing it's probably not that great. And when it comes to purity, what is on the inside is most important. When you look at the Bible, there are five different types of purity. Now, I want to go ahead and tell you some of these we can't have. For example, the first time of purity, first type of purity you find in the Bible is divine purity. This is God's purity. When we look at the Bible, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And as we look at the Word of God, we find His holiness. And can I say, you and I will never reach on this side of heaven that holiness because God is holy and we will never have divine purity. Then secondly, there's created purity. When God created the heavens and the earth and all that's contained within the earth, it was perfect, it was good, it was pure, it was wonderful, it was spotless. And in God's words, it was good. When he created man, it was very good, perfect. Can I say you and I will never have created purity because we have the sin nature and we were born into a world that was already corrupt. But there's something called positional purity. That is because of Jesus Christ dying on the cross, paying for your sin. The moment that we are saved, the purity of Jesus, a big fancy word, is imputed or put to our account. And positionally, those who are saved, when they stand before God, are positionally pure. And rather than him seeing our sin, he sees the perfect, spotless, pure, non-sin account of Jesus Christ. Now... We can't get divine purity. We we have never experienced created purity. You can receive positional purity, but there's a fourth one, and that is living purity. That is living a pure life in the world today. That's where we receive a challenge. That's where we struggle. There's also a fifth purity, and that's ultimate purity. That is for those who are saved when we receive our glorified body and we get to spend an eternity in heaven with Jesus, we will have ultimate purity at that time. But tonight, we're going to be talking about that fourth type, the living purity, that practical purity that you and I have. And so let's go back to the beatitude, verse number eight. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So now that we see exactly what purity is, it's important that we realize Purity is not about what is on the outside. If God had just said this, Blessed are the pure, for they shall see God, the religious people in Jesus' day would have jumped for joy and said, Good, we get to see God. Because the Pharisees, who were the very strong religious people, and they were a people who were extreme by the rules, they knew the Old Testament law, they did every single thing in the Old Testament law that was there, and so as they looked at it, they would look at that and go, man, this is great, because on the outside, they knew all the motions, they knew what to say, they knew what to do, they were able to follow every single little rule and work hard at it, and so they thought, look at us, we are great. But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus didn't say, blessed are they that are pure, for they shall see God. Blessed are they that are pure. Blessed are the pure in heart, 
or they shall see God. You see, God is concerned about the heart because the reality is you can never fix the inside by just cleaning up the outside. But can I say this? You can clean up the outside by getting the inside taken care of. In fact, God took his harshest criticism out on the people who were concerned about everything on the outside. In fact, he said, he said in other words, basically, you keep the outside of the cup clean, but the inside is filthy. He says you're like whited sepulchers where the outside is beautiful and polished and fancy, but the inside is full of dead men's bones. He's saying on the outside you look beautiful, but on the inside you're disgusting. And can I say, if you're disgusting on the inside, eventually it's going to make its way out to the outside. I want you to picture for me just for a moment a disgusting experience. You take and you make a cake and you hollow out the inside and you put roaches, you pile cake back on the outside, and you could frost it and make it look beautiful, and everybody would go, wow, what a wonderful cake, that's gorgeous, I would love to have a slice of that cake, and the moment those roaches start coming out, they're going to be disgusted and run, do you know why? Because what's on the inside is what's important. And it's important that we realize that God is concerned with the heart, not just the outward appearance. By the way, on a side note, and this is somewhat uh, comical, can I say this? It doesn't matter how many clean clothes you have on, if your armpits stink, you're going to be known. Yeah. You ever notice that? How potent it is when somebody can, somebody can be around you and they can have on clean clothes, but if they haven't taken a shower in three months, guess what's going to happen? There's going to be a stench. And can I say, when our inside is filthy and we just try to mask it on the outside, guess what takes place? People begin to notice and God is no longer magnified in that life. Jesus is not just interested in reforming our manners. Jesus is not just interested in with com outward compliance. But God is concerned with your heart being pure and cleaning up our inside so that our outside will be clean and new and fresh. When God looks at you, I think of back in the Old Testament, the prophet came looking for the next king. Saul had messed up. He had lost his kingship. His son would not be king. He had disobeyed God. He had lost the royalty. And when he died, the royalty would go to another family, the family of Jesse. It was so bad to me. I find this interesting. David to Jesse at this time was not big enough of a deal to him, his own son, that when the famous prophet came to town, all the other boys were home. They weren't working. They were all at home. David's out in the field. And the prophet comes looking for a king. And Jesse basically, well, there's no hope for David. He's the youngest. I've got all these strapping sons, and they're strong and mighty. There's Eliab, who was a great young man, strong, looked good. He could be a great king. And the king came and looked, and none of them were suitable. But there was another son. His name was David. And the Bible says, man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. Because God's concerned about what's on the inside. By the way, if the heart is right, the outward appearance will get right. So God's not saying there, hey, the outward appearance doesn't matter. He's saying get the heart right and the outward appearance will follow. Realize, now it may take time, but it's going to change. Change will come. And we need to realize that God is concerned with the inward appearance. Can I say this? Never get so busy or looking like you're so busy for God that you don't take time to condition what's on the inside because as Brother George taught this morning, you grow, you glow, and you go. I think unfortunately we got a bunch of people that are so busy going, they're not doing any growing, therefore they're not glowing. It all goes together and we grow inwardly. We will glow outwardly and we will go outwardly. And so as we look at the Word of God here, the Bible says, Blessed are the pure in heart. God is concerned with your heart. I want you to turn over to Jeremiah chapter 17. Hold your place, if you would, in Matthew chapter 5, because we will be back. But Jeremiah chapter uh, 17, we're going to look at a heart problem. How many times have you heard, there are certain sayings that just kind of bother me, and this is one of them, but how many times have you heard this, just follow your heart? I mean, you hear it all the time, and it sounds so good, right? 
Oh, you live in America, just follow your heart and you can do whatever you want. And it does, it's one of those sayings that just sounds nice. But right now we're going to find the problem with just following your heart instead of walking in the way and following God's will. As we look here in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9 and 10, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Number one, realize this, the heart is deceitful. You realize that the word deceitful comes from and derives from the same word that Jacob refers to. And if you know Jacob in the Old Testament, he was a deceiving young man. In fact, his name meant supplanter or a deceiver. Jacob was ultimately a con artist before God got a hold of his heart, changed his heart, and gave him a new name. By the way, aren't you glad that God gives you a new name written up in glory when he changes us? But the heart is deceitful. In fact, the Bible says that the heart is deceitful above all things. Have you ever met something or saw something that was just deceiving? Whether it's something big or small, I'll give you an example. I remember one time when I was a kid, I was running around playing, and, and uh, we came inside. It was my brother and I, and it seems like his friend was there, and we saw what looked just like pink lemonade. We were excited. We poured it in cups, and we took a big swig, and it was grapefruit juice. <laughs> Can I say, when you're expecting one thing, such as pink lemonade... And you get grapefruit juice, it is not a pleasant experience. It's disgusting. I saw recently there's a Bible college out in California, and on April Fool's Day, they messed around with the food, and I may get some of the ingredients mixed up, but it looked like you were going to have a hamburger and a cupcake. But the cupcake, what looked like a cupcake, was actually a meatloaf. It looked just like a cupcake, it was a meatloaf. And what looked like a hamburger was actually a cupcake. And so, you know, you go to eat your hamburger first and you take a bite and it's not a hamburger, it's a cupcake. And then you go, well, what's this cupcake? And it's a meatloaf. And it was an April Fool's joke because it was deceiving. I'm going to tell you, that messes with your head. And ultimately, it can become at first, until you get your mind past it, it can become rather disgusting. We find here that the heart is deceitful above all things. You can try to come up with the most deceitful thing, and the most deceitful thing that there is above all things is the heart. Well, your heart will tell you all sorts of things. That's why your little kids are fearless. Do you know why we're less fearless than little kids? Because when we climbed up on those things, eventually we fell down and got hurt. But boy, the heart will tell you, as, especially as a little kid, you can do anything. You can jump off that big old thing, and it won't hurt you. Today, uh, the nephews and, and nieces were over and so forth, and we had a fun time at the house, and one of them thought it would be okay, and thankfully nothing happened, to hit the baseball toward the house. Be okay? Now, we saw that. Thankfully, nothing got hit except for the house, but it wasn't hard, and it was okay. But I had a flashback to back when I was a kid. My brother and I were in the front yard over here at West Berkeley Circle, where we lived, we're playing ball. And in our minds, it was okay. Because we would just hit ground balls, you know. Just hit it on the ground, they catch it. Sure enough, my brother threw me a pitch. And just my wonderful baseball talent, I couldn't hit a ground ball. Hit a little pop fly. It was a little looping pop fly. And it, it went, and then boom, right into the neighbor's window. Thankfully, the window didn't break. But suddenly, we decided... That we were done playing ball. We went in the house. I remember a little bit later that day. Looked out the window and the lady was on the porch. Suddenly, I had to go to the bathroom. Because that's that one place where you're safe, you know? <laughs> Unless you're a mother and you have a toddler. But other than that, you're safe. Then they're, then they're at the door, you know, just waiting for you to get out, you know. And so you're safe there. And I thought, I'm safe. I was in there like panicking because I thought she was just making me stew, you know? Come to find out she had made some banana bread and brought it over or something for us. And I, I don't know if maybe that was heaping coals of fire, you know, like you hit my house, I give you bread or what. But man, I was scared half to death. But back to where we started, 
in my mind, in our minds, we were deceived to think that we could control the baseball. And oftentimes we are deceived into thinking we can control our heart. And our heart is deceitful above all things. By the way, our heart has a disease. The Bible says that it is desperately wicked. Can I say we've gotten to the point in our sin nature that we've fallen and we can't get up by ourselves? You know, you have the old commercials, I think it's Life Alert, where the older lady falls down and she's got the button and it's, Help, I've fallen, but I can't get up. Can I say our sin nature, we have fallen and we can't get up by ourselves? It's desperately wicked. Because the heart is deceitful, because it's desperately wicked, we desperately need the Lord. Notice verse 10, I, the Lord search the heart. We need the Lord, the doctor of our heart, to search our heart. We need the good physician to clean us up. Remember, to cleanse us so that we can be pure, so that we can be clean, so that we can magnify God. And He is the doctor of the heart. The Bible says, I try the reins even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doing. So as we look at this, we realize we have a heart problem. By the way, so how do we then pursue purity? Can I say there are some ways that people have tried to? One of them is a term called legalism. By the way, some people ascribe this term to anybody who has any uh, standard, any standard. By the way, everybody has a standard. People just have different standards. Everybody has some standard somewhere. But legalism ultimately is trying to gain the favor of God based upon our works. Can I say we can't gain the favor of God based upon our works? There is only one way to get saved, and it's not of works, lest any man should boast. For by grace are you saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Can I say this? We cannot gain favor with God any other way but through Christ Jesus. That's not how we get a pure heart. We don't get a pure heart by working and doing great works, and that outweighs our old works. It doesn't work that way. Then there's another one called modernism. Modernism is what the Sadducees did, and what they did, and what a lot of people today do, is they refuse and they refute and reject the doctrine of God. And instead of taking the doctrine of God... They have taken the beliefs and thrown them to the side and said, just do whatever you want to. Can I say that's not the right way either? Then there's what's known as activism. They believe that the only way to purify one is through political change. Can I say the change in America will not come through politics? Now, politics, there are certain things that will help, and that may help our economy. It might help our, our nation as far as our national security, but it will not help purify our hearts. The help for us spiritually and the purifying of our hearts has nothing to do with Capitol Hill, and it has to do with the hill called Calvary. And so we need to realize, though politics is, is, is their job is not spiritual, by the way. Their job is political, meaning that their job is to dealing with the economy and dealing with national security. It is not dealing with the purity of our heart. That's Christ's job. So politics isn't going to purify our heart. Then there are some other people, and there's a fancy title for it, monasticism. And these people believe that they must literally go live remotely out in the middle of nowhere and disengage from society to be pure, to be clean, just totally disconnect. The problem is this, and that's not as popular as these others. The problem is this, they don't work. There is one way to find purity, and that's through Christ Jesus. Turn over to Philippians chapter 2, if you would. Philippians chapter 2, and uh, verse number 12. Philippians chapter 2, and verse number 12. It's important that we look to the Word of God to find the remedy that has been exposed to us in the Word of God. And in verse number 12, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Before we move on, I want to point out that does not say work for your salvation. It says work out your salvation. Can I say this? If for some reason you had atrophy that took place and it was to the extent that you had no muscle whatsoever, which is almost a physical impossibility, but if it did happen, did you know you can't work to get new muscle? You build up what you have. 
You can't work out something that you do not have. And so because you have salvation, you work out your own salvation. And ultimately, you work to follow God. But how do we do that? How do we purify ourselves? It's found in verse 13. For it is God which worketh in you both the will and to do of his good pleasure. The power is that which lives within us. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Realize the only way that we can truly be pure is through Christ Jesus. Now, as we look tonight, I'm going to give you, and and trust me, we're almost done, so don't get scared. Most of that was introduction. I'm going to give you 10 things that we can uh, follow, and some of them are, are things that uh, will take place often, and some of them are things that will take place at one moment. But we can find 10 things that we need to do, or we can follow, rather, that we can develop pure, a pure heart. Number one, we first got to admit that we have a problem. We have to admit that our heart is filled with sin. When we look at something, you ever heard this, the, the, uh, uh, the leopard can't change its spots. The reality is God can cleanse us. But we first have to realize that, guess what? I have a problem. And can I say, for most of us, that's not that hard for us to realize we have a problem. But we've got to get past this little, yeah, I've got a problem, and realize, wait, I've got a problem. You know what you do when you have a problem? You look for a solution to fix it when you actually realize it. Not to disregard the problem, but to admit and to accept we have a problem. Then secondly, we need to ask God for a clean heart. David uh, prayed after he committed a grievous sin. By the way, oftentimes we look at David's sin and says it's grievous. Do you know the most grievous sin is the one I commit? Because honestly, that's the one that I have to answer for. And so as we look at this, he created a grievous sin, but what did he do? He prayed, create in me a clean heart, O Lord, and renew a right spirit within me. So let's ask for God to replace our filthy heart with a clean one. Pray for purity. David knew how impure his heart was, so he prayed for purity. The Bible tells us number four. This is number four. Draw close to God. The Bible says, draw nigh unto God and he'll draw nigh unto thee. And God is sitting there just waiting for you to come to him. Because you realize God creates with us a free will. God is not a dictator God that's sitting there going, you will do this, you will do this. He goes, this is what I'd like for you to do. And he's just waiting for you to respond. And if you'll draw nigh to him, he'll draw nigh unto you. Memorize, meditate upon the word of God because this ultimately is what purifies us. And so we cannot use what it says if we don't know what it says. And so we got to meditate and memorize the word of God. Number six, be careful to avoid complaining and arguing. Boy, I tell you, the Bible says do all things without murmuring and disputing. Can I say this? Murmurings and disputings do not come from a pure heart. Murmurings and disputings come from a filthy heart. Back to what we said this morning. You can live in peace. Did you know you can live in peace even when you don't agree? Do all things without murmurings and disputings. If, if, if we, could, we could come up with some task, and I guarantee you, with as many people as we have here, we'd probably come up with at least 10 different ways to do it. But you know what? We can, we can do all things without murmurings and disputings, but that can only come from a clean heart. But work diligently to avoid those things. Be careful what we allow in. You know what? You will never think about something that did not come through one of your senses. You will not ever think about something that you did not either see, hear, smell, touch, or taste. So be careful what you allow to come through those senses. By the way, there are certain things that you can look at and turn away from and not engage your other senses. Typically, we get in the most trouble when we engage multiple senses. And so make sure you're you're careful what you take in. Number eight, be patient. Be patient. Don't expect today to come in and be sitting here and hearing this sermon and go, you know what? He's right. My insides aren't clean the way they should be. My heart's not clean the way they should be. Clean my heart. You go out tomorrow and go, what happened? 
thought I got a clean heart last night. It takes time for change to be effectual. And so we need to be willing to wait. Find someone that can keep you on track. Find someone to be accountable to. I remember whenever I answered the call to preach. I answered the call to preach, or surrendered the call to preach, rather, when it was after camp ultimately was over. It was late on a Friday night. All the in invitations were done. It was near midnight. Everybody else in our cabin was already asleep. I couldn't sleep, and I surrendered. I told God that if he let me get some sleep, I'd go tell somebody in the morning. And I promise you this, if I hadn't gone and told somebody the next morning, I probably wouldn't be preaching today. Because you know what I'd done? I'd talk myself out of it. And so be accountable to someone. And then, number 10, realize there is hope. There is hope. Don't think that because you're at a point where you're at now that there is no hope. There's hope. And that hope is the one who cleanses us, Christ Jesus. Realize there is hope. Now, there's a second part to that beatitude that I want you to see. Turn back to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, the second part, for they shall see God. You know the problem oftentimes why we have it, why we don't see God is because we've been blinded by sin. Our heart is so filled with the disgustingness that sin brings with it that we're blinded by our sin and all we can focus on and all that we can see is sin. By the way, when we look at our world, oftentimes we look and we look around and we go, wow, there's all kinds of crazy stuff going on. This morning I mentioned some crazy um, cases and, all, and I could talk about all kinds of crazy things going on in America. Can I say there's a lot of good going on too? And oftentimes we are as happy as what we focus on. And can I say that sin nature wants you to focus on sin. But blessed are they that are pure in heart, for they shall see God. David was a man after God's own heart. And David was a man who sought after God. He was someone who strived to follow God. Can I say this? What's on the inside will eventually come out. There's a story of a little girl, and she was walking along, and a man's dog started, a vicious-looking dog, started barking at her, and what did it do? It scared the little girl. That's what, that's what big dogs do to little girls, right? It scares them. And she began to do what any little girl that was scared half to death would do. She began to bawl crying. The man yelled at his dog. The dog kind of backed off and stopped barking, but the little girl was terrified, and she continued to cry, and so her, little, her mother came over to her and held the little girl and said, Listen, honey, it's okay. He's not barking anymore. And like little kids can do through their tears, sometimes they can say the cutest little things, even at the wrong moment. She goes, Yeah, but the bark's still inside. <laughs> <laughs> and the reality is this. We got to allow God to clean the inside. Because that dirt's still inside. And the dirt will come out. And because of that filth and dirt, we don't have the opportunity to have that beautiful view of God because we're so blinded by sin. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. There's a story of some people who purchased a new boat. Big boat, 22-foot boat. Big twin outboard engines. It was a nice boat. They took the boat out for its first, its first voyage, which is always the most nervous one. And they, they got the boat out there, and everything they tried, they could barely get the boat to go. It was just sluggish, and it just wasn't going like a new boat ought to go. And So after trying for about an hour to make a go at it, they went back to the marina, and they went to a, uh, the shop where they bought it, and they said, there's a problem with this boat. It's just not going I don't get what's wrong. We just paid good money for a brand new boat and it's just not going. Well, the mechanics began to look at it and they brought the engine up. The, the engine was moving up and down just fine. The engine was running fine. The propeller was spinning. The propeller was at the right tilt, which believe it or not, makes a big difference at the right tilt. They couldn't figure it out when one of them thought, I wonder if there's an anchor attached. They didn't see a rope anywhere, but maybe there was an anchor attached and they didn't see a rope, but one of them thought, hey, I'm going to jump in and just check the hull of the boat and so forth, and they jumped into the water. 
to find a problem. The boat looked fine. The problem was it was still attached to the trailer. And they're trying to move around and they're held back by something that's not even supposed to be there to begin with. Can I say oftentimes we're held back by what's not supposed to be there. Oh, it can't be seen. You, they, they couldn't see the trailer. That's why they checked out the engine. If they would have been able to see the trailer underneath there, they would have said, duh, that's the problem. And that is why people are able to hide their problem is because it can't be seen because it's on the inside. But eventually, it makes its way to the outside. Let us allow God to clean us. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God.